finally awake. Hello and welcome to the Politics of Skyrim. I'm your host, Connor, joined by the Imperial on my right, Josh. Greetings, citizen. Harry? I am a pirate. Yes, or the sea shanty from RuneScape. Fantastic. Yes, and and local reach man. <laughs> Skyrim clearly belongs to the Force One. This entire podcast was inspired because we had a bit of an office disagreement over who was right in the Civil War. Josh, obvious in which side he took for all of our... Yeah, the, the, the correct side. Okay, right. Um, Harry originally agreed with me in that Skyrim belongs to the Stormcloaks, and since his reading is going to be a filthy fence-sitter, I think. I'm not a filthy fence-sitter. I'm entirely on the side of the Empire. Listen, there it's is... nothing to do with our gold. We didn't pay him off at all. There... <laughs> I used to be a proud son of Skyrim, but then I realised it would be much smarter if the proud sons of Skyrim didn't divert the resources of the only people who are between them and the Thalmor fighting a, fighting a basically pointless war for now because even if they win, the Thalmor get what they want because the resources of the Empire have been diverted, completely <laughs> wasted. They can f uh, fold over, steamroll the Empire up until the borders of Skyrim, at which point all of your resources have also been similarly destroyed and then you're screwed because you wanted to play silly buggers looking for independence at a very imp uh, improper time. Allow me to uh, build upon this. So my argument for why the Empire is right is that um, the, the Falmor and the High Elves more generally are banning the worship of Talos. We know Talos is real because in the Knights of the Nine DLC, yeah, <laughs> summoned up yes. in, in, in Oblivion, yes, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm so engrossed in the Elder Scrolls universe. Sorry, I'm just watching uh, the local man try and drink. Local reach, man. This is what happens when you take a barbarian and try. This and is why put you lost your. Society. This is why you lost your homeland. This is why we intern you in Sydney Mine this forever. Is, <laughs> this is why Markarth only had Force One rule for about two years before before Ulfric smashed yeah, it. Was it because you guys were too busy <clears throat> failing to drink from mugs. But anyway, it was a it was a, it was a virtuous rule. Mm -hmm. If you know anything about the law. Back, back to my case. So obviously, Talos is real, real god. He summons you up. He gives you a holy weapon. And he gives you the the only means to defeat. Uh, uh, is it Umaril? Someone like that. Some I think that's the name. I think but that some is big, the name. Big baddie, and only through his divine power can you defeat this this boss. So we know from the, the lore of also of the Talos, Elder Scrolls. Talos was just Uriel Septim the first. Yes. Who then ascended to godhood through his heroic deeds? Exactly, and I, I support this notion. I mean. The Empire is built around the Emperors, and because they have actual divine power in that they are dragonborn, there is a, a legitimate case for it. And so I feel like I've proven that Talos is real, because there is evidence of it. In, the in, Falmor are spreading fake news, clearly. Yes. Um, yeah, don't trust big Falmor. Um, and yes, Tal Talos is real, and his worship should be allowed. And so the problem here is that the, the war that precedes Skyrim um, where it was men against elves, um, the, the Nords were fighting am amongst, um, or alongside, should I say, Wolfric the Imperials. Himself was an Imperial so soldier. And they were fighting the elves, and so turning on your brethren after you've been defeated in war, I think is quite a cowardly thing to do. And I, I actually think that the best chance they have of restoring Talos worship, which is the thing that started the civil war in Skyrim in the first place, is by joining your forces of all of the men against the elves, right? Because, of course, if they were defeated once when it was all of men against the elves, then how are they going to win again when it's just Skyrim? It seems like Skyrim versus the world. I mean, it's like Germany declaring war on the world. It didn't go well for them, did it? And uh, I think the, the, the nationalism and taking your country back and the sovereignty is all well and good. But if you are unable to worship a god whose divine power is provable, then you're making a compromise that isn't worth it. The divine is more important than national sovereignty when it comes to, you know, a real god who yeah, you so should be worshipping. My brethren are the greatest in Skyrim for this reason. You're just taking the Forsworn side. Yeah, I am a Forsworn. Yeah, right? but where do the Forsworn really sit on the Civil War? They're the kind of well, a, a, they a pointless the, independent they're, faction they're, that have nothing to do with it. They are the ethnic... Uh, men of the reach they have been rooted out by 
evil men like yourselves. This is just called imperialism. I, 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 as a member of a noble Scottish family, I know this very well that the old the ways... Scottish. The old ways are the right ways. And, you know, basically, I, I, we had a big battle yesterday on this table about tradition. And I am a traditionalist, as you can see. <laughs> and... <laughs> I was the one conservative bulkhead against the rising tide of progressive, the 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 uh, roasty, the roasty redemption mafia, um, <laughs> the roasty redemption mafia. That led sounds by, like the worst hip hop collective I've ever heard. <laughs> led by Yal Yal Ben Hamin <laughs> and, his, and, his, and his little boy Connor, <laughs> and I came away from it thinking, you know what, modern society, what's what what is this about? And I went back to the hills. I went back to where my brethren would have would have been the naked men of the force worn. And I said, <laughs> well, they have to be naked. And I said, this is this is the right way. That, don't don't the Nords ethnically predate the force worn in Skyrim? No, the force worn the force worn were there first. Right. Do you, do you have anything of relevance to add to the civil war discussion? <laughs> only only that the force worn were completely fair to take advantage of it and take back Markov when they did. All right, nothing of value was gained in that outburst. <laughs> Force One did nothing wrong. <laughs> so, so that's Roy's position. But, but a few things on on the original argument for the Imperials. Um, first of all, I think the mechanics of Skyrim being, I think, one of its main faults is that your player character is a god in every single domain, and so you are the X factor in the Civil War. So, no matter what faction you pick, you are victorious because you are the direct descendant of. Cyber Septim, you are one of the Dragonborn. And so you're basically unkillable warrior Jesus. Yes, but having tried this myself after a, cu- a few squeak- uh, sneaky quick saves, um, if you do try and face down an army purely by yourself, you are going to get wrecked. That's only if you aren't high enough level. Well, I, I am quite high level, but still, I, last night I completed the main quest and I was at school, the, the, the one that you go to before you go into the portal to Sovereign Guard. Right. And uh, there were a lot of high level drow here. And if I let them all gang up on me in a corner, um, then they wrecked my S. Okay. The, but-, uh, but if the, you had a very high level army made up of multiple Tullius types, just having the Dragonborn there would probably not sway the tides. Especially as well if you had all of the Thalmor who are all quite high level and have mages and priests of their own who can do all sorts of magic. Okay, but let's let's speak purely theoretically here. If you max no, out No, I deal in the concrete, not okay. in your abstract. Calm it. If you max out pure pure if you max out your level and then you can become the whisperer or the listener or whatever it is for the Dark Brotherhood. So you are the agent of Sithis. You're the dragonborn. Don't you can become eyes. head of the Thieves Guild. You can become the Archmage of the College of Winterhold and an ambassador for every single Daedric prince wielding their demonic weapons. All at once with no penalties and no drawbacks, unlike yes, in but, other RPGs. But Bethesda's RPG design was somewhat lax, let's say. Sure, yeah. but, but, but you've got... A, kind of take that into account when you realise that the Dragonborn is the X Factor in the Civil War. So therefore, whichever faction they join, they ultimately strengthen the faction. Well, so, in, in that case, if we're going to take game design into account as a factor in this, I'm going to say, you have been taken in by Bethesda's emotional rhetoric because from the very start of the game, what does it do? It positions you with the Stormcloaks. You are on Ulfric's uh, uh, cart that he's been taking to his execution. The first thing the game does is position you against the Imperials. It biases your perception of the conflict by making it so the first thing that's about to happen to you is the Stormcloaks are about to die by your side. The leader of the Stormcloaks is about to be honorably executed alongside you while the Imperials are about to kill you for basically no reason because you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And you don't have the context of the greater battle, the greater war that's going on at the time, to colour your view of what's actually happening, which is that Tullius has received the perfect opportunity to end the war before it goes too far and drains all of the Empire's resources fighting a pointless war up north. And the Thalmor um, interrogator, who's there as one of the main people at the embassy, what's her name? Ellen Wynn. Ellen Wynn is there to try and stop him because she knows that having Ulfric alive means the war carries on, ruins more resources from the Empire. She is there specifically to stop it. And he, Tullius, wasn't going to. And it's only because Alduin shows up at the last, <clears throat> excuse me, at the last minute that means that 
Ulfric doesn't die, the war doesn't end right then and there, and the Empire can go back to amassing its resources for the inevitable second phase so of the have, Great War. I have something to build up on here. My, my pirate mercenary colleague here makes a good point. And um, to, to kind of, before I forget to mention it, um, to bring stability to the Great Empire, one must mod it. That, um, <laughs> that is how you, you improve the, the, the balance, right? You, you bring balance to the Empire by installing mods that change the damage modifiers. Finally, we agree on something. Yes. Um, any less than 140 and you are weak. Your, your Empire is going to disintegrate. You need many, many mods. But on the character of Ulfric, because uh, bringing this back to the Civil War, and rather than uh, you know the, these, these petty video game politics things, um, Ulfric... If you actually go down the, the Stormcloak quest line, you, you get to learn Which a, a I bit did of it. The first time I played uh, I, the game, uh, we all make mistakes, don't we? And uh, I did the same. And uh, you get to get a bit of a, a character of the man. And racist. Well, perhaps, but um, they don't treat the Dark Elves all that well. But no, it, to be fair, in the Grey Quarter, the head of the Nissus Corner Club is an Imperial spy. Like he does have Imperial armor and a weapon and the book about the Third Era in his attic. So. I, I wouldn't shout at them in the street either, but... I'm not saying that he has no reason to be suspicious of foreigners in his city. I mean, I think we can all be quite sympathetic to that perspective. But anyway, um, he basically admits that he has ambitions for the throne. It's not about Skyrim, it's about him. He only cares about it, and he actually takes credit. The Dragonborn does all the hard work. He sits on his ass the whole time in um, Winterhold, I know he called it Winterfell, um, and you go out and do all this Windhelm. Windhelm. Damn. Winterhold's the other one, isn't it? That's yeah, where the college is. Yeah, sorry. I'm more, more of a serial well, man White myself. Man. No, Ulfric's in Windhelm. Oh, yeah. So. yeah. I'm all about you. Um, yeah, he's, he's obviously got ambitions to become king. He, he has the power of the voice. He sees himself as comparable to that of the empire, emperor. And so that's why he murdered the emperor. And um, we well, murdered High King Torig, not the Emperor. But the Emperor does get killed. Yeah, you can murder the Emperor. And that's a him. very valid point, tying back into my original argument about the ability for the, the player character to be basically the god of everything, is that if you do go down and you max out the game, the Empire is going to be in an inevitably weak and vulnerable uh, situation anyway. So it, it, without its Emperor, who's going to fill the, the void there? Me. Uh, okay, are you going to give a serious answer at any point? <laughs> I've already been giving serious answers. I, I throw one joke and then you try and colour the rest of my arguments so far. Typical rhetoric coming from a Stormcloak subversive traitor. What can I say? I've got the power of the voice. But anyway, <laughs> sorry to derail. Yeah, so I, I think that Ulfric's motives are, are questionable because, of course, he seems very self-interested. He's more than happy to capitalise on your hard work. Let's not forget that there was already a moot prior to the events of the game that he was involved in where all of the other Jarls chose not to vote for him anyway, which suggests that most of the Jarls, or at least enough to uh, sway a majority, didn't trust him in a leadership role for the whole, for the whole of Skyrim. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.